a while ago, um, you worked on Game of Thrones yes. or developed the spin-off. Mm -hmm. um, can you can you say what happened with this? Uh, I mean, you're not probably not. <laughs> I can say that. Uh, no, I think you know it's it was an amazing. Like I had an uh, I had an amazing experience with it. I'm extremely proud of uh, of uh, the the. We did a tremendous amount of work. I'm really proud of it, and uh, and maybe one day uh, it will see. You know, it'll have its moment. You know, that's that's my hope for it. But uh, we'll see. I know, you know now they're they're really developing out a lot of projects uh, in that world. And, uh, you know, I'm doing a different show at the network that, like I say, is I'm deeply in love with. Uh, I am also really in love with that project. Uh, I would love to one day be able to do it. So we'll see. Did your series or the one you were developing, did it have a title? Like, how far did you get into it? And or was it sort of like you were still in like the Bible stage? Uh, it was, it was very developed in terms of um, the world and the Bible. There was, there was a script, there were outlines and I mean, certainly, yeah, we had a title. We had a lot of stuff. Got it. I spoke to Naomi Watts and, you know, she shot a pilot with Jane Goldman, know, that, yeah. you know, obviously didn't get picked up and she still hasn't even shared images of her costumes and everything. Yeah. Well, I mean, you know, it's very much like an important proprietary brand and I don't own it, you know, it's, it's HBO's uh, property and, uh, you know, I'm really proud of the work we did. Uh, and obviously I love them and we work together on, on other things and on this show, but uh, you know, it's definitely in their court as to, you know, what could theoretically get released. This is a jokey question, so bear with me. <laughs> um, every time we post about Godzilla versus Kong, uh, on, in the comments and on social, uh, half the responses are, why don't they just kiss? <laughs> My wish. question for you is, uh, so in any version of the script, did you have Godzilla and Kong kissing? We never had them kissing, but I regret that. But I do think that in a sense they do. I mean, they're animals and animals don't you know, exactly kiss, but there are moments, they have a moment of, uh, uh, there are moments of connection between them. I think one of the great achievements of the film is bringing about, uh, you know, whether you're, a Kong, whether you're Team Kong or Team Godzilla, I think you're satisfied. And I think the two of them, uh, without, without either of them bowing to the other, they both have their moment in the sun and they both uh, achieve their grudging respect. So for them, I think that's a kiss. You started working on Godzilla like a long time ago. You, you're one of the people that worked on all four of the movies. Yeah. Um, when, you, when you were developing or writing and working on it back in, I guess, 2013 or whatever year it was, did, was, the, was the vision these four films like how much were you thinking about what could be back then and what actually happened? Yeah, I think, you know, it's from the very, in the beginning, the idea was, can we make a Godzilla film for America, American audiences that respects the franchise uh, that has been this very multifaceted, complicated uh, franchise, and, but still feel, uh, you know, something that Godzilla fans would appreciate and something that will resonate today with American and global audiences. And then as we started to feel that, well, we kind of, we got something here, it's working. Then in, in and around post-production on that film, uh, Legendary, and at the time the head of Legendary, Thomas Toll, uh, had this notion of, I want to build toward Godzilla versus Kong. And, he, and the pitch to me was, can you do uh, a version of a King Kong story that's fit in this universe and we had developed this idea of monarch this sort of organization and a lot of that stuff had come out as we were doing godzilla and then it became uh okay can we do kong uh and uh and but when kong was introduced thomas's idea and ambition as a fan was one day we're going to be able to bring them together and you know and, and so yeah it's kind of cool to see it actually having happened yes i'm going to give him a lot of credit uh, and I've, I've spoken to him uh, a, n a number of times back when he ran Legendary and he was a full geek. Oh yeah, absolutely. He totally is. And he's, he like, he just unapologetically loves, uh, he loves King Kong. He loves Godzilla. I would imagine that in the writing process, there's all sorts of ideas that get developed. And then someone with a budget says, yeah, you're not doing that. <laughs> so um, 
were there any things that you guys came up with or you came up with that didn't get to be included just because someone with a line item said you, you can't do this? Well, I don't know if it's as simple as that, but definitely uh, like, you know, it in, you know, I, I've been involved in each of these movies at different phases, you know, over the course of, it's been quite a few years now, almost a decade. And like, and uh, uh, when I, came into Godzilla it was right around basically at the same time as Gareth Edwards, the director coming in. And we, there had been some scripts and we kind of reinvented it. And at one point in the process, uh, there was a set piece that was on an aircraft carrier and it was like batted around by Godzilla and you were with the people as it got inverted. And it was like Titanic capsizing with Godzilla. And I loved that set piece as like I was writing it, it was just something I was really proud of. And ultimately like it got cut fairly early on just because of like the insanity of the expense of it. And it, you know, uh, but then when I came back in on this project, I came in a little bit later in the process where we were sort of closer to uh, pre-production and there were a lot of the bones already in place. And it was kind of about assembling the, uh, assembling them together. Uh, and, you know, doing what you do when you come in as a writer at that phase. But one of the things that I discovered when I came back in is that, you know, probably having nothing to do with the set piece that I had once written, but like here we were on an aircraft carrier having like a badass fight where the whole ship was going to get turned over and flipped. And like, it was like this thing that I had written once before, much cooler now because both creatures were involved. Uh, but get, being able to kind of dive back in on that with like, if not a bigger budget, I, I honestly don't know and couldn't speak to that, but certainly like a more evolved franchise that had grown to the place where that was now, you know, the ante had been raised to like, we have to do this kind of battle in order to like compete with what we've done to sort of start to top it. So that became kind of fun. I would imagine that each of these movies was able to, like the VFX in each of these movies have, um, I don't know if they've gotten easier, or I guess what I'm curious about is, how how has the writing how have you guys sort of worked with the vfx and sort of crafted like what's possible were there any things that you were writing that just like seemed like the vfx can't do this and now we're at the point of like you know you look at this recent movie you have kong in the snow which is just you know crazy yeah and beautiful i thought like i mean i you know i don't i couldn't speak to that you know, I'm not, a, you know, I'm a layman when it comes to VFX. I mean, I, you know, obviously work with those incredible artists, but like, uh, I don't know uh, what we have now that we couldn't have done, but I definitely, it's definitely clear that like, you know, I think the lessons get learned in terms of like, you know, you're dealing with like a different problem with scale with these creatures. Like the scale of the creatures is something that creates you know, challenges because in reality, things of that scale, like we move extraordinarily slowly, right? So there's like all these things you can kind of like, but so you have to mimic that on some level and in certain shots uh, and in other shots, you want to see them, you know, throw a fast punch. But the truth is like the, the way, you know, the way that they would appear uh, in reality would be a lot slower just from perspective questions. And so there's like, it's an interesting, um, you know, process of discovery in terms of what those artists have kind of like gotten better and better and better at over time as they've like learned how, uh, you know, uh, how to create these scenes uh, to cater to Kong, to cater to Godzilla you mentioned years ago that Thomas's original vision was Godzilla versus Kong. You guys now made Godzilla versus Kong. What, was there ever something that was after this, like in terms of in the development process or was this, is this sort of like, wait a minute, we're at the peak. It feel, I mean, I, it's, I'm, you know, hopefully there will be, I have no idea. Uh, but I, uh, but if not the peak, at least, uh, you know, a, a plateau that everyone's been aiming for. Like this is the this is a this is a point that has been part of it, uh, an ambition from the beginning. So you know, I look forward to whatever the next uh, iteration of this franchise is. But I think the um, you know this has certainly been getting these two characters to. Re it's a little like the Avengers. You know, it's like you build to that place, and then it's not to say there aren't future uh, movies that bring everyone together, but. 
those are the kind of like, that's, that's one goal that shouldn't be discounted. Uh, what do you wish people knew about the making of these movies? Oh my, you know, just selfishly as the writer, I think it's fun for people to know that, um, you know, as the writer, it's not the dialogue. I mean, that's always part of it, but that a part of what goes into this is being a part of building out storytelling, not just over, not just in terms of what the MacGuffin is or what those pieces are that kind of build what you think of as story, but in terms of crafting uh, the, the, the set pieces and the sort of like the beat by beat moments that result in emotional uh, connection to these characters, to the creatures and, uh, and investment rooting interest and all those moments where you cheer or you cry, like that's part of what the writing of these stories is. And I think it's, you know, it's all done in these movies. There's such a huge uh, uh, kind of group of uh, talented people working together collectively. But I think oftentimes, you know, one of the things that, you know, people think of the writing as being the, that line of dialogue and that's really not it, right? I think there is every now and then I have like, there's few, a few lines of dialogues in the entire franchise uh, that I could go like, ooh, that's one that I, that from, that I remember in the beginning, it stayed the same and it lasted. Like, let them fight is one that I remember writing. And I loved that moment because it felt iconic and cool and it became part of the movie and it's still there and it's an internet meme. And there's a couple of those moments in this movie. Uh, but to the, the, the truth is most of the legwork uh, and the, um, the challenge and the reward of it uh, is in building out the emotional moments. So like the discovery of, oh, what if, you know, if Kong and Gia sign language, you know, communicate by sign, is there a moment where we lie to Kong uh, about the fact that maybe his relatives or his ancestors are down in Hollow Earth because we need him to take us there. And so there's this emotional moment of betrayal. Like that's sort of what the writing entails. And as much as, okay, we want to do a set piece on the water uh, between these two characters. Well, what are the different what are the different moments? Like think you're, imagine you're Spielberg and you're building like a masterful set piece. Like what are those out of the frying pan into the fire, suddenly you're trapped in the waters and you're, the whole ship is inverted and the water's, you know, coming up to the floor. And, you know, those things are all part of it. Um, and it's all done uh, collaboratively, but it's, uh, that's, that's where the real fun and the real challenge is. It must be pretty awesome to be an internet, to have created an internet meme. You know, like let them fight. To me, that's like honestly, that's one of my, that's one of the proudest, coolest thing. And it's like I remember, I was there on the, like I remember when, I remember when the line came, and I remember when, um, when we were looking. It was very much like, oh, we're looking for a trailer moment in that, and it was like, oh, this feels like a good one. Has no one ever said that? I mean, maybe they have, but I don't remember it. And then it felt like, and then, you know, I remember being there on the day, and I, and Gareth kind of had that really like cool, simple push in on on uh, the character and it's just like i'm ken and it was like oh that's badass no no it's it's fucking cool um do you are there easter eggs that have still not been found in these movies oh my god i'm sure <laughs> uh you know I, yeah i'm sure there are i don't uh i, I like it would be hard for me to point out a few but like uh, they were there yeah, it's cool. Let me, the different question. Do you think that the Jurassic Park movies exist in this universe? And if so, <laughs> have the people that work at Apex seen them? Uh, I, I would say, eventually to say they do exist because this is the, it's the real world and Jurassic Park predates uh, the arrival of Godzilla in 2014. So yeah. And I would, who hasn't seen them? So you're basically saying that the people at Apex just ignore them. Well, I mean, you know, humanity hubris is, you know, is eternal. We we always ignore our own past, <laughs> whether it's fictional or otherwise. It's true. Um, with Hollow Earth, uh, which is like, it's just a cool, like Hollow Earth is cool. And how much did you guys figure out like the Bible of how Hollow Earth in case you do get to make another movie or they want to pursue this? How much is all that sort of done? Uh, I, I don't, you know, I don't, I... I don't know if someone else has a Bible to it. I don't. I think like it was much more of an organic thing. Uh, but, you know, for Adam, I thought he did such a beautiful job of really like 
when I first came in on this film, like I said, more was developed, but one thing was he had this very clear vision uh, specifically for what the hollow earth entry would look like. And he kind of envisioned it as being almost like the 2001 light show and really wanted to lean into that like laser light kind of uh, aesthetic and those like uh, those tone color tones and that whole sort of vibe. Uh, and I thought he like pulled it off magically and the, the trip to hollow earth, like what I love about it. Cause in the script at different times, it had more plot behind it. And ultimately we kind of stripped away more and more of like the plot reasoning. There was an L there was a MacGuffin is ultimately why they go down, but, but less and less of import happened there and more, and it was able to just become an emotional experience for Kong. Less, I mean, the people are there, but it's Kong's journey. Like it's his journey to his homeland and, and being it, taking out more of the human sort of rigmarole of why they're doing that and allowing us to just live with Kong as the music plays and he has the experience of connecting with, you know, what's, you know, what is, what he has this sort of like, you know, uh, uh, spiritual and like, uh, and um, kind of deep seated uh, ancient connection to this place was just beautiful. And I had never s lived with a mo with like kind of a monster or a Titan or any Kaiju in quite that way before uh, that I thought was really powerful and, and like beyond uh, what I could have imagined initially. No, completely. I, I think that sequence works because you give a shit about Kong, yeah. you know, and you care about him finding his family. Um, did you guys figure out the history of the ax? Uh, I mean, implied but not specifically like to me it's like that's you know the godzilla's scales have this kind of conductive radioactive quality and that the uh the primate kongs uh were you know had a kind of evolved uh you know civilization of sorts you know as primates might and simple tools and had used the spine of a godzilla creature uh to create it you know, presumably there are more like it, but it feels like the iconic scepter of the king. That's what's sort of so fun about it. Could there be other titans that are sort of asleep in Hollow Earth? Oh, I would venture to say there must be, right? It's a big, uh, it's a big world, it's a big Hollow World. <laughs> but yeah. I was just trying to piece together, like when you're watching, because I saw it twice, and the second time I'm like, I'm trying to do measurements in my head. Like, how big is this? Is right. this like miles? Is this like a hundred well, miles? That might just be one continent part, you know, like one section of it, let's say, right? I bet someone has done the calculation of how large that little inner sphere would be. One of the things that I really enjoy about this movie, and I think a lot of fans are going to enjoy, is that it doesn't hold back on monster action. Like Kong and Godzilla are throughout the movie. Mm -hmm. And can you sort of talk about, was it always designed that way? Like, uh, I mean, I guess like figuring out where to insert the, the monsters. Yeah, oh, I think it's one of the, it's to my knowledge, it always was, certainly from the moment I came in. And I think like one of the fun things about being involved, like one of the, you know, one of the few kind of creative people uh, who's been involved in each of these films in some capacity has been being able to see how we've, we, you know, our, we, we've, we've been able to kind of like un, uh, like unchain the handcuffs as we go on. Like with Godzilla, Godzilla it was very much about like, let's be grounded and let's like introduce this character to the world. And it's a world, a story world that had never seen Godzilla before. And so it can't just happen right away. Like we have to like tease it out. And, and some people responded positively to that. Some people wanted more right away, uh, but there was a very conscious choice that went in. And then obviously with Kong Skull Island, it was a little bit more, but it was similar where it's like, you, you know, you build up, you get to the island, he's there, you start interacting with him, but you're not, he's not your main character. You still have, you know, these characters, these human characters who are kind of your way in. Well, now I think we, you know, we've gotten to a, a late stage of the franchise in a good way that's allowed us to, to, we've done the groundwork of building audience investment with Godzilla, building audience investment in a different way with Kong. We understand, we care about these characters and we've earned the fact that this is Godzilla versus Kong. Like this is, that's, they are the stars 
They're the marquee characters. And all the human characters, I mean, something I've learned in working on this franchise has been that like the best human characters in the show, in the movies, are the ones who fit the bill of the kinds of characters you would put around movie stars in movies, which is which are character, character actors, characters, right? Like you have you might have your James Bond, and then around James Bond, you find fun and charismatic and humorous and different characters who fit the bill, but you know your star is Bond. And in this case, your star is Godzilla and your star is Kong. And we've earned that. So now the other characters can have a little more personality. Their role is not to be, they don't have to carry the film on their shoulders. They're, they're in some cases, our emotional touch point as human beings. In some cases, they're comic relief. The, the human beings become the supporting actors and our Kong and our Godzilla are the stars of the movie. And I think by, we've earned our place to that uh, in this franchise and that it kind of makes this film unique and special and like gratifying and rewarding in that way, I think. Hey, well, listen, congrats on Godzilla and everything. And, you know, obviously uh, I look forward to talking to you about the Lakers thing uh, once it. you guys, you know, when you're further along. Cool. I look forward to that. Thanks. Um, and also uh, in, in say hi to the cats. I will. She says, she says. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, by the way, you you've seen that Owl Kitty trailer, haven't you? Uh yes, I have. It's really funny. Okay. Yeah, I'm just making sure because that does look like Owl <laughs> I know, Kitty. That's that look. And I was like, well, maybe he is Owl Kitty. <laughs> no, like, you know, I were. But awesome, man. It's really good to really good to meet you. I look forward to another time.